It's good to be with you again. I want to uh, bring good news to you today. My theme is we, Christian people, we are the people of the future. I want to read you a familiar verse that was part of our reading uh, today from Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What good news that is at the present time. We are living through difficult days. I recall a time when I was uh, invited to preach in Arkansas in the southern states of the uh, United States and uh, the minister, the Reverend John Smith, uh, met me, take me to an afternoon meeting. On the way he said, I want to stop and show you a phenomena. And on the way to his uh, church, we came across a scene of devastation. There was a house, he said, yesterday, there was a, what we would call a bungalow. There was a house uh, standing there and look at it now. And all that was there were just crumbs of uh, timber. A timber framed house had been devastated. You know what had done there? Termites. In 24 hours, they had completely demolished that house. And I think about that and I think about other termite like things that uh, affect us. You know, going through this uh, pandemic at the moment, uh, we wonder what it's all about and if there's any future. Some people begin to doubt. These events that we're going through can have a devastating effect on our, our thought life. But you know, God has made us so that we can be a fairly resilient people. We can withstand an enormous amount of pressure. We can survive the heat of the, the tropics. We can uh, cope with so much. We, with undaunted courage, we can face this present pandemic, illness, financial loss, disappointment, loss of work, domestic disappointments, and so much more. Life is tough. And we can cope with all of this so long as we don't lose one essential ingredient. And that essential ingredient is hope. We can rebound against wind and weather, against calamity and tragedy, disease and death, so long as we have hope. That's why God calls hope the anchor for our souls. And that is at the heart of the verse that's before us today. God gives us hope because he tells us that we are the people that have a future and a hope. Now the coronavirus has affected the whole world and many people are wondering if the world is out of control. Of Christians we are persuaded that God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone for God is still on the throne. I want to affirm today, and I don't mind you saying amen, <laughs> that God is sovereign in all of the affairs of the world. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. He is over all. He will have the final word. <laughs> he's sovereign and he's active. God is active. He's doing something. I, I don't know about you, but I've heard many people ask the question, why doesn't God do something? <laughs> I tell them God has done something in sending his son into the world to show us that he loves us and there's a purpose in, in everything. But God is active in the chaos of the present time. The trouble is we can't see what God is doing. See, God is not only sovereign and active, he's working according to his plan and purpose. It's carefully ordained. He's got a, a plan that has been prescribed from eternity. In Acts 15 verse 18, we read this, so relevant. At this time, God said it, and now he's doing it. It's no afterthought. He always knew that he would do this. Now, God has revealed his program and his purpose for us and life in the Bible. The Bible is absolutely reliable. We believe that this is the inspired and infallible word of God. And it contains history and it contains prophecy. History is fulfilled prophecy. And prophecy is unfulfilled history. It will be. The Bible therefore assures us that God is working to his program. He reveals that program to us. Do you remember the story of Abraham? 
when God came to him and he said this, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? No, God wants to reveal to his servants exactly what he's about and what he's about to do. But if we're to know what God's plan and program is for our future, we need to study the Bible carefully to discover what it is. All God's prophecies will be fulfilled. It's a phenomena, you know, prophecy. It's said that in the Old Testament there are over 300 prophecies concerning the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing. It's been calculated that for all of these 300 prophecies to be fulfilled in the life of one man in the space of just 33 years, the duration of his life, it would take one chance in 83 billion. Isn't that phenomenal? And because we know that God has fulfilled prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus, we know that all the other prophecies yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. So let's come to it. What is God's future program? You'd like to know? Well, let me tell you a few things today. Let me tell you, first of all, about God's future program for the church. In Romans chapter 8, we're assured that God is going to glorify the church. There's a wonderful chain of events that God is doing in the life of a Christian in Romans 8. Let me read this to you. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined, and those he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he glorified. Do you understand what this chain means? Well, we're studying. It means that no one who is foreknown fails to be predestined, and no one who is predestined fails to be effectually called, and no one who is called <laughs> fails to be justified. And no one who has been justified and sanctified will one day be glorified. The point of this chain is certainty and confidence, assurance and security. Hallelujah. This point is, the point is, is that God is not just offering salvation. He saves. Jesus is the saviour. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came into the world. That's why he lived a perfect life, died upon the cross of Calvary and rose on the third day so that we might be made right with God. Are you right with God? There's no reason you shouldn't be if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus. Those whom he has predestined are saved. It's as good as finished. That's why even the future work of God in glorifying his people is put in the past tense. Those he's justified, he glorified. The glorification of God's predestined, called and justified people is absolutely certain. No one that is called will be lost. The chain is unbroken because the links have been forged in the furnace of God's eternal purposes. Hallelujah. God's plan, plan and program is that all who belong to him will become like him. For when we see him, we shall be like him, writes John. Oh, a little hallelujah. God's got a plan for you and me, and he's working it out. And it, the ultimate purpose is that we should all be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be glorified. But, you know, one has to say something about Israel. God's future program concerning Israel. Hundreds of years, God's ancient people have been scattered throughout the world. Today, I've checked my facts, there are 15 million Jews living and gradually returning to Israel. There are now over half of the Jews alive living in Israel. 30% of them in the United States and the other 20% are still scattered around the globe. But the return to Israel over the last 70 years is nothing less than phenomenal, a miracle. Why? Because God's word says clearly that the day would come when his scattered people would be returned to their land. Let me read from Isaiah 11, verse 12. He will raise a banner for the nation and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarter, quarters of the earth. Now, the story of the nation, uh, nation of Israel, of course, begins with Abraham. And God promised that there would be as many Jews as there are sand on the seashore and stars in the sky. And he gave them a land that we know as Israel. 
And as we study the scriptures in Romans chapter 11, we see that those that once rejected Jesus scattered around the world, the day is coming, I believe soon, when there will be such a mighty move of the Spirit of God that the Jewish people's eyes will be opened and many of them, before the coming of the Lord Jesus, will recognise him as Saviour. Now, let me say this. There is no second chance uh, when it comes. There's, there's only one way to be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His name is Jesus. And for Jews to enter into the eternal kingdom of God, they're going to have to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so must you. But that's God's future concerning his church and concerning Israel. But what about God's future for the earth, the earth we, which we inhabit at the moment? When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Many scriptures promise this. But before that happens, something's going to happen to this earth. And Peter writes about it. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear like a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Hmm. It's going to happen. This old earth is going to be burnt up. It's going to be devastated. What then? Let me take you to Revelation. Then, said John, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I encourage you to, to read uh, what this eternal kingdom is going to be like. It, read about it in, in Revelation by all means, but also in Isaiah 65. It's going to be the home of righteousness, of justice and peace. Oh, my heart cries out, Maranatha. I say it every morning, I say it every evening as I look to the sky. Even so, come, uh, Lord Jesus. Yes, Jesus is coming again. He's coming for all those who put their trust in him. And when he comes... This old earth will be destroyed and there'll be a new home, a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, I want to be amongst that number when the saints come marching in, don't you? Well, what about Satan, our great adversary? What's God's future program for him? When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. He completed the work that he came to do. By his death and resurrection, he gained victory over sin, death, hell, and the devil himself. And when he returns, all evil will be banished from the kingdom of God, including the instigator of all evil, Satan himself. Let me read you from Revelation 20. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. Nothing can be right on this earth while Satan still roams free but God's program is one day to banish Satan all his wicked works and all of his followers well one last thought what is God's future plan for the Lord Jesus Christ well long ago it was recorded time would come when our Lord Jesus returns and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of glory now. He's going to be recognised by all as King of Kings and Lord of all. Those that have rejected him and resist him will then, in that day, come and bow the knee. The next great event that we look forward to is the personal return of the Lord Jesus to the earth. Are you ready to meet him? As he says at the end of Revelation, I am coming soon. Can you answer with me today? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Oh, I hope you can. I want you to think for a moment about who the Lord Jesus is, God the Son, and what he did. He came to Calvary, and there he died for me. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. But you know, we're only saved when we put our trust in him. Have you trusted Jesus Christ? as your Saviour. I want to challenge you today. You say, what must I do? It's simple. Uh, ABC, you have to admit. have to admit that you're a sinner. We don't all sin alike, but all alike of sin. 
And we have to believe that Jesus is the only Saviour and come and put our trust in him. How can we do that? Well, see, we have to call on him. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That's a chorus we used to sing. You can make that your prayer now and ask him into your life. Maybe right now, wherever you are, in a church building or at home, in your car, <laughs> parked up somewhere watching. Can you? I ask you now, if you're not sure that you're going to be amongst the saints that go marching in, to make sure today by asking Jesus to come into your life. Let me lead you in a prayer of commitment. This prayer is inviting Jesus to come into your life, to forgive your sin, become Lord of your life. Make this your prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you for dying on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you for the offer of forgiveness and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I receive these gifts of grace right now. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing my prayer and coming into my life. If you pray that prayer, the Lord Jesus heard it. There you're a child of God. But if you pray that prayer, please do let someone know if you belong to a church or you know a church, do let them know so that they can follow up and help you to become a disciple on the way. But if you want to write to me, you can email me. My email address is jjames43 at virginmedia.com. Please do get in touch and let me know. And if you do, I'll send you a little booklet that will help you to know what to do next. God bless you and thank you for sharing this message with me.